Welcome. This is the second video of a two-part series that I'm doing on Martin Luther. And in this video, I'm going to talk about Martin Luther. The first video, which I hope you've already seen, covers what medieval Europe was like at the time of Martin Luther. So if you haven't seen it, I recommend you go back, watch it now. If you've already seen it, then let's dive in. So in this video, I'm going to talk about Martin Luther, the timeline of some of his key events in his life, go into his thoughts on free will, and then see how that intersects with his theology of baptism, and then give you some concluding thoughts. Martin Luther was born in 1483, and he was born into just kind of a common family. And you can still go see his house today, pictured here, preserved in its relatively uh, original condition. It was renovated after a fire, uh, but it's still preserved in the same architecture of the time. So Luther's family, his dad was a miner, and at the time it was a normal thing. He just worked his way up and was able to actually own a couple of mines, which is to say that Luther's father was fairly well to do and was able to provide financially for the family. Now, one way to better a family's finances, as mentioned in the previous video, is to become educated and get an educated position. So Luther's father had really hoped that Luther, who is a very promising student in school, Luther's father hoped that he would become a lawyer. A lawyer made good money, and by making good money, Luther would then be able to pay for his family and to uh, provide for his family, especially in the later years. Luther showed great promise in law. Uh, he was a sharp student and was able to work very well, um, get his bachelor's in the minimum amount of time. <clears throat> and so Luther seemed to be on a good trajectory in law. In 1505, while traveling between towns, Martin Luther was struck by lightning. Now at that time, lightning was a spiritual experience. And this could be either the work of the devil or the work of God. So while being struck by lightning, Martin Luther cried out to St. Anne and declared that he would become a monk if only he were to live. Well, he lived. And so to follow through with his word, he joined the Augustinian order and joined the Black Cloister. Now Luther, he's a very good academic, very studious, and did very well at the monastery, uh, learned all the rhythms, and he participated in one of the critical parts of being a monk, and that's confession. Remember that the Catholic Church had the gateway to the God, which also meant that if people wanted eternal life, they needed to go through the Catholic Church. And the way to do that was for the forgiveness of sins and distribution of sacraments. Now, the Catholic Church had seven sacraments. The primary one for monks like Luther was confession of sin. And there, through as his confession of sins, Luther met who would become his mentor, Johann Staupitz. Now, Luther, being a good man of, <clears throat> of conscience, would confess his sins. But as soon as Luther left, he realized that he had more sins to confess. So he'd go back in and reconfess the sins. And he would spend hours every day confessing sins, which prompted Johann Staupitz to tell him that God is not judging you. You are judging God. And this planted a little seed in Luther because there's a little bit of an irony that you, in order to confess all sins, everyone has to spend continuous time confessing a sin because as soon as Luther left the confession, he would have a thought or see something and he would then have a tug at his heart and he'd have to go back in and confess again. So this built very heavily on Luther. But again, he did very well at the monastery. He learned his practice as well. And so in 1511, he was sent down to Rome to help seek the Pope's authority on a rift that had grown within the Augustinian order. The Pope gave no judgment, he turned Luther away. So Luther came back in what would be a failed, a failed uh, <clears throat> you know, endeavor. And because of this, he was forced out of the Black Cloister and told to go live in Wittenberg with Johann Staupitz. Now, Wittenberg, here's a picture of the town square today. You can still go there. There's a lot of tributes to Luther 
Um, there's statues and there's the a picture of the 95 thesis um, and, and such that you can see many tourists in this picture. But at that time, Wittenberg was a backwater town. It was kind of a rough and tumble on the edges of farming town. There's very rough farming there too. And so it's kind of a, a step down for Luther. But he ended up doing very well. Again, he picked up his studies and began to work harder, and he began to grow in his theology. <clears throat> Luther progressed quite a bit uh, as a monk, and he became a, pr a preacher and did very well academically studying and preaching. And as he grew into this, he became more and more curious and more critical of the practices of the Catholic Church, especially the selling of indulgences. Now, the Catholic Church wanted to raise money to create a basilica for St. Peter, and so the selling of complete indulgences was authorized by the Pope. Now, these indulgences would remove a lifetime worth of sins for people, and so these could be sold at a much higher price. And so Luther, seeing the Catholic priests come to town selling indulgences to people, Luther began to question this. And you can see a picture here of how the selling would work. Someone comes to town, uh, they preach about how everybody's going to hell. You know, you know, remember life is rough. And so if you want to be saved, then you need to buy an indulgence. And then lo and behold, there just happened to be somebody there who could sell you an indulgence. So Luther began to preach against the selling of indulgences as a hypocrisy of the church. So, along with other reforms, Luther eventually wrote up 95 theses, and in 1517, he nailed them to the door, as we famously know. Now, this is what uh, the plaque of the modern 95 theses. But these were an attempt at reform. Luther didn't want to leave the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform it. <clears throat> so, after posting these, the Catholic Church um, headed by the Pope, of course, were upset by this renegade person named Luther in this backwater town of Wittenberg, and so they charged him with heresy. Now, this is a heavy charge, because heresy is going against the church, and if you go against the church, you're going against God. So this is a very heavy charge to level against Luther. Now, Luther, being in Germany, which again, the German princes had a lot of tension towards the Catholic Church and viewed it as a foreign southern Italian power. And so Prince Frederick III uh, was very much enamored by Luther because Luther was someone who was willing to stand up to Rome. And so Frederick III you know, also decided to back Luther for political reasons, perhaps less so than for the, uh, the theology that Luther was espousing. But remember that the Catholic Church and the Roman Empire were kind of one, tied together. The church and state were very much interbedded. And so in 1521, the emperor, Charles V, requested to see Luther and, discuss, and hear about Luther's uh, theology. And so what was going to happen was the emperor was really telling Luther he had to come and to reject his writings and to take it, retract all of his stances. This is a very heavy charge and a really dangerous situation for Luther because a previous person who had, uh, Johann Hus, who had written and taught reform in the Catholic Church uh, was also met with death at a similar event. So for Luther to meet the emperor was really, a, is a very real stance that Luther is walking to his death. The emperor gave his word that he would allow Luther to show up at the Diet of Worms, which is the meeting where Luther would meet the emperor. Uh, Frederick III was able to secure a safe passage for Luther to and from Worms. However, the safe passage was guaranteed to Johann Hus uh, in the 1400s, and uh, Hus was also killed. So even though Frederick III had secured written permission for Luther to have safe travel to and from Worms, the threat of death was still very real. <clears throat> so Luther met 
Charles V, the emperor. You can imagine that Luther standing in this room with the emperor. The fear, knowing that what Luther was going to say, and here he was, why he was here, he was here to retract his statements. However, rather than hearing Luther out, immediately Luther is shown a book of his, <clears throat> a stack of his books, and was told, these are your books, are they not? And so Luther looked at the books and said, yes, those are my books. And then he was asked to retract all of them. Well, Luther, taken aback by what he was shown, asked to come back the next day. So Luther went back, thought about, prayed, seeking what should he do in this situation? he knew that if he stood by his books and his writings, then there was a very real threat of death. And if he retracted them, then he would be conscious of going against what he thought was the true gospel. So he was in a bind. In the end, Luther decided that he would stand by his writings. He declared, here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So this famous words of Luther speaking to the emperor, uh, we, we're fairly sure this is what he said, but you know there could be some different wording, but the, the effect is the same, that Luther stood firm against his writings and would not retract his word. Now, while he was leaving this, Frederick III, also called Frederick the Wise, arranged for Luther to be abducted. So while traveling out of Worms, Luther was caught off guard, abducted by some unknown men and whisked off to Frederick the Wise's castle. Now this is a clever plot because Frederick the Wise now had Luther and Luther was willing to stand up to Rome. So Frederick the Wise, while harboring Luther, was also harboring kind of someone who could speak to Rome and kind of voice some of the grievances of the German princes. And again, this wasn't necessarily based on the theology as much as it was politics. So these things go hand in hand. Now Luther was able to continue his work while being held at Frederick the Wise's castle. Luther spent a lot of time in solitary. It was kind of a mentally dark place for him. However, he's also able to work on a lot more of his thinking and really flesh out some more ideas in the solitary. Occasionally he would go back and able to sneak off to preach at Wittenberg, but he had to go in disguise because of his heresy and because he stood by his writings at the Diet of Worms. There was now a death warrant on his head where he was to be killed upon sight. <laughs> so Luther, no longer part of the monastic order, was now able to marry. And as Luther began to get his writings out due to the help of the printing press, other people began to follow him. As he gained a following, other people began to leave their monastic orders, including a very particular Katharina von Bora. Now, Katharina is a former nun, and she was a very savvy woman, and, he and she and Luther met, and in 1523, they married. Now, Katharina ended up managing the family finances. Luther was a little less adept at managing the family business and finances, and so, thankfully, Katharina was able to take that on and able to uh, brew a very good brew uh, for many passerbyers. Uh, and so Luther is very thankful and lucky to have her. Now, Luther also began to correspond with other people who sought to reform the Catholic Church, um, especially a person by the name of Erasmus, who had also seen some of the hypocrisy in the Catholic Church, and he's a predecessor of Luther. And the two of them had some correspondence about free will and how would a person choose God. This is really important to Luther because, remember, as a monk, he spent hours in confession. He had to confess every sin. And so Luther was aware of his inability to follow the law. And so Luther really struggled with, well, if I can't follow the law, then how can I choose God? Because my will is to choose not God. Erasmus, however, argued that no, we do choose God. And so the two of them had quite a correspondence in which Luther wrote the bondage of the will in the year 1525. 
I'm going to go into more detail on this later on, but I just want you to know that this is what is the forefront of Luther's thinking at this time. One of the things that Luther highly valued is education, especially of those who administer in the church. So Luther wrote the large catechism in 1529 to really help the clergy in their work and lay out what they would and would not teach. Now, Luther would also um, bring these together in the Augsburg Confession later on as more of a, a coalescence and a refinement of here's the essence of his theology. And, and Lutherans today uh, still very much follow, follow or hopefully are aware of the Augsburg Confession. Now, in Luther's later years, we come across some more difficult topics that Luther covered. Um, in 1543, he wrote a piece called On the Jews and Their Lies. And this is a very troubling thing to read for many of us Lutherans and really not something that we would like to work through, but it's something that as Lutherans, we need to acknowledge that Luther wrote um, as it has had an impact on our relationship with the Jews and has unfortunately fostered hatred towards the Jews, especially during the Holocaust, um, also in Germany. In his piece on the Jews and their lies, Luther said to burn down their synagogues, force them to work, and deal harshly with them, slaying 3,000 lest the whole people perish. You can easily see how this could be used as a fodder against the Jews, and unfortunately it is still used. Um, at a synagogue in Spokane, Washington here in the year 2014, and Right now, here in 2021, um, a synagogue has been emblazoned with swastikas. This is a picture of that synagogue. And there's the swastika on the side, and that's a Holocaust memorial. So, as you can see, it's a very clear sign that you are not welcome. As Lutherans, this is a painful thing to address. It's something that we would wish doesn't exist, but Martin Luther did write it. And so we do need to acknowledge that this is part of our Lutheran heritage. And we also are called to reject this, that this is not the gospel speaking. So be aware that this is there and please speak up on this. <clears throat> now, I'd like to go farther into Luther's theology on free will, because this is a really where a lot of, I think, forces come together where Luther really shines. So the Catholic Church taught that if you are faithful, you will keep the commandments and then you will become a righteous person. However, Luther and Erasmus both saw that we cannot keep the commandments. We all fail. And both of them sought to reform the church, um, but they began to differ on how their free will plays out. So Erasmus viewed scripture as it's ambiguous, and there are many interpretations in a more of a pluralistic view. And so there can be many perspectives in the same passage in scripture um, and open to interpretation, and we should discuss those. Erasmus also in this pluralistic perspective noted that we are autonomous. and He stood by that we choose God, that we have as an autonomous being that we each have the ability to choose God or not. Now, Luther, again, back to his former monk years, he was very much aware of his inability to choose God. Um, and he, so he taught where the scripture is very clear. There is no ambiguity. Uh, it's more of there is one interpretation. It's very much a God clear. We are not autonomous beings because our will leans towards sin and death. It is only by God's will towards us that we are saved. And so this is where the saves by grace and that faith is on God's end come from. That Luther saw that as much as he would confess, he would end up as a sinner. And so our faith is brittle and fragile and it comes and goes. Therefore, faith comes from God. And our grace, we are saved by the grace of God. 
and that we cannot do anything because the works of man are the works of Satan. Because our will is towards sin, our works, therefore, must be for Satan. Whereas it's when the Holy Spirit comes down and enters in us, it's from this perspective that we are able to do God's word. Therefore, it's God in us, God's grace, the Holy Spirit in us, that does the good works. We cannot. <clears throat> Now, this theology plays out in Luther's view in the sacraments. The Catholic Church had seven sacraments, which is baptism, confirmation, marriage, confession and penance, mass, the holy orders, um, and then an anointing upon one's death. Luther revised this and said, no, there are only three sacraments, the Eucharist, confession, and baptism. And within these, these three sacraments, again, because our will is towards sin, that we distribute the Eucharist, it isn't just bread and wine. But when the Holy Spirit intercedes, it becomes the body and blood of Jesus. It is not our work of distributing, again, because that would be a works-based theology. That would be our works, and our works are for Satan. So it's when the Holy Spirit intercedes with the, <clears throat> the bread and the wine that it becomes Christ. Similarly, in baptism, it's when the Holy Spirit enters into the water that baptizes us. Otherwise, if we were to do it, it's just water, and that would be the work of Satan again. And so for Luther, this free will and the faith being on God's end, not ours, really comes through in a lot of other places. <clears throat> and so that's where the Luther's rejection of a works-based theology is so critical and such a key component of his theology and our, as Lutherans, what we inherit from and follow. <clears throat> so while Luther had obviously rejected the Papal authority and instead placed his authority in God, there was another reform movement called the Anabaptists. Now, the Anabaptists went a little farther than Luther. And so, again, Luther very much uh, respected the authority of the church. He wanted to reform it, he was very much a supporter of the authority and wanted to educate the clergy. The Anabaptists, however, the democratization of sacraments, anybody could conduct baptism. And that anybody could be baptized as long as they were an adult and able to make a choice. So the Anabaptists <clears throat> were really, what they wanted to do is create a purity of belief. And so they taught that if someone was baptized as a child, they were an infant, they didn't make the choice. They were not educated. They did not know the choice that they were making because they weren't given a choice. And so in order to have a pure belief, only an adult could be baptized who could understand what was happening at the moment of baptism and who could actually choose God. And not only that, you didn't have to be a priest. Anybody could perform the baptism so long as they were aware of what they were doing. Now, Luther saw this as a free for all well, we can't have anybody going just baptizing anybody else. This just, I mean, this is just going to be a chaos. <clears throat> and so, in a sense, Luther kind of was standing by the central authority, like the church, and he wanted the sacraments opened up for everybody, but he did not want it distributed by just any old person. So I've included this table here, um, noticing some of the differences between the Catholic Church Luther and the Anabaptists. Um, the key part is the authority. The Catholic Church relied on the Pope as the authority who spoke on behalf of God, and so the ultimate authority came to the Pope. Luther, the ultimate authority, it's God. All authority comes to God, whether it's scripture, it's the authority that we receive in baptism, um, the same with the Anabaptists. <clears throat> now, who could administer these? Well, the Catholic Church and Luther agreed that the priests had to be educated and called 
<clears throat> which would be another, the calling that Luther discusses is another topic, which I'm not going to get to in this uh, talk, but I encourage you to look up Lutheran vocation. And then the Anabaptist, of course, anybody, any adult can perform the sacraments, um, not just baptism. The Catholic Church, <clears throat> um, and who can receive the baptism? Well, the Catholic Church would discuss that. Well, the people allowed by the church. So that, again, there's that gatekeeper aspect of the church. <clears throat> Luther said, no, anybody can receive the Holy Spirit. It is not our choice. But again, faith is on God's part. Grace comes from God, not us. Therefore, we all receive. And the Anabaptist, of course, the recipient, it was only going to work if it was an adult who was willing, understood what they were receiving, and was able to receive it by another understanding adult. <clears throat> so I'd like to kind of bring things together here before we go into our parting thoughts. Just to lay out the, the really key points here is that good works come from God, not us. Our faith is by God, not by human. Because as people, we are prone to sin. Our will is towards sin. So good works come from God. I also want to point out the Reformation was not one unified movement. It actually splintered off into various differing perspective views. Um, such as the Anabaptists being one, there are several others, uh, which I didn't have time to go into here because there are many books written on Reformation itself. So if you want to learn more about those other um, people, other reformers, and other lines of thought, then I encourage you to go do some research on that. Um, and I also want to conclude by noticing that Luther really respected authority, um, and not just the authority of God, but also the authority of education. Luther was a very strong proponent of education. Um, and largely why he wrote the, the large catechism was to have a centralized authority and to have you know, an educated clergy. And so there's an authority in that, but not the authority of everybody like the Anabaptists. So I'd like to leave you some questions uh, to consider from Luther. I'm curious, based on what you've heard here, where do you see Luther's theology today? Uh, whether it's on our ability to choose God or not, where does ultimate authority lie in the church? Is it in God, in scripture? Who has the authority to perform sacraments such as baptism? Where do you see Luther's theology and what are the sacraments? What do you consider sacraments? And then also Luther was looking at things to change and reform in the church. And I'm sure all of us have, at one point or another, perhaps you've seen some reforms that are something you would like to see change in the church. I'd like you to think about what reforms do you see as being possible? Where would you like to see the reforms? And then following Luther's example, how do you balance reforming the institution while also respecting its authority. This is one thing that Luther really struggled with, never quite did. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He didn't want to leave it. But in the end, he was excommunicated and removed from the Catholic Church. Now, not every reform will, get, will go quite that far extreme. But just how do you balance that, that um, those tension of, on one hand, wanting to change an institution a church, while at the same time maintaining the authority in that church. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I hope it's sparked some thoughts in you, and I hope you come away with a, an enthusiasm for Luther as much as I have. So thank you, God bless, and peace be with you.